Angel is brought to you by Audible with an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash angelbook. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Angel, the podcast. Yes, this is our new podcast where... We interview angel and early stage investors about how they make their investment decisions and their general philosophies of supporting companies and founders to grow meaningful businesses. One of my good friends in this effort in the early stage is Dave Samuel. He is from Freestyle Capital and he's a tremendously caring, caring, intelligent, savvy, uh, and very successful investor in the early stage. He writes checks from $250,000 to a million initially, and then upwards of $2 million on the follow-on fundings. It's a 75-minute discussion, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. If you're starting a company, this is one of the top 10 investors you can get for that early stage. So enjoy. Dave Samuel of Freestyle Capital. Hey, everybody. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, meeting with great investors, great entrepreneurs, and people who want to change the world and make it a little bit better through this crazy capitalism, journalism, I'm sorry, capitalism, entrepreneurialism uh, model that we have here in America and spreading around the world quite nicely uh, has led to some of the great uh, resolutions of problems we have and, candidly, a lot of abundance and life getting much better for the majority of people. Still a lot of work to go, but uh, I've heard some people recently complain about the financial structure and venture capital and how it all works. I think we can always get better, but let's not forget that a lot of the great companies that were built in the history of humanity as solving some of the greatest problems that we face, whether it's global warming, communications, transportation, housing, these things are not solved by governments they're solved in large part by entrepreneurs who are crazy enough to take on the world. And a key part of that process is the funding of those companies. So while you can be critical of capitalism, venture capital, angel investing, and the whole system that we've built up and all the incredible companies it's built, it is flawed. It's broken sometimes, but it's the best system ever created. And it's why the United States, on a GDP basis and on an influence basis, outpaces any other country in the world and continues to do so, even though we only have 300 million people here, a fraction of what some other countries have. Now, is it going to stay that way? Obviously not, but it is amazing to me every day to wake up and see the scale of companies here in Silicon Valley and the impact they're having on the world. My guest today, Dave Samuel, has played a large part in that. He's been an entrepreneur, he's been an investor, and he operates in the most critical early stage of venture capital an area where people write $250,000 to $1 million checks. That area has been largely abandoned by traditional VCs who are taking less risk, moving downstream, and saying, come to me when your company has three, four, five, ten, twenty million dollars in reoccurring revenue that we can predict easily, and then we'll overpay and take out all the risk-taking. But some of us, we like to operate in the difficult, hard area what I like to call the Goldilocks zone, because it is an opportunity, not too hot, not too cold. The company may be launched, but the company may not have hit scale yet. That's where Dave Samuel seems to operate, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but he is the co-founder of Freestyle Capital, a personal friend of mine, and somebody I admire very much. Uh, All the founders I send to him come back uniformly with a, wow, that guy is smart, and he gave me his time and his energy. And that's really what it's about, is doing the work. And I think a lot of times people in our business forget that. So with that, I'll welcome Dave Samuel, finally, Thanks, to Jason. the program. I know, we've been talking about this for a while. I know, it's crazy. You know, I just, all of a sudden, I have these like, moments where I'm like, Dave hasn't been on the program, or this other person I've known for 10 years or 20 years hasn't been on the program. Like, we've got to get this one done. It's been a long time. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, it's been a long time. Now, we met back when you were doing something called Spinner. Yes. And you had... We both sold businesses. To AOL. To AOL. Yeah, and back then, selling a business to AOL or a Yahoo was considered for our generation of entrepreneurs, we're like the Gen Xers, to sell a company for $20, 30 $40 million was, that was kind of the goal. Yes, yeah. 
What did Spinner sell for back then? We sold for three twenty. Three hundred twenty million dollars. Yeah, incredible. We were we were lucky. That was one of the biggest acquisitions of that time. Ten times bigger than uh, Weblogs Inc., which I sold. That's fifteen times bigger than Flickr or Delicious, which I think were in the twenty million or TechCrunch or any of these things that sold in that sort of cohort. You were a little bit before us. Yeah, we were lucky. Um, that was May of ninety nine. What did Spinner do, and why was it so valuable to AOL? So we launched the first internet radio service back on April 1st, 1996. And um, really the service was, has many similarities to Pandora today. Hmm. And so we just had internet radio. Hmm. And in, you jump forward to 99, and AOL was looking for a radio play. We had launched Yahoo Radio, and when Corp Dev was like, wait, we can buy this company and we can basically set Yahoo back mm. also, because there's lots of kind of geostrategic things going on, um, the stars align. Basically, wow. Josh and I wanted to, back then you could take companies public, and we had many friends, if you look at even David Goldberg with Launch Media, he took yeah. the company public, but man, it was a tough slog once you went public, because yeah. after 2000, it was just difficult. So we were well, fortunate. Yeah, when the market to, crashed. People market crashed. Are, some people were entrepreneurs today. Yes. Uh, don't remember were, that. <laughs> they were 10 years old. The Maybe companies not even. were investing it. It's, it's weird to get old, isn't it, sometimes? Yes. Yeah. Um, you have to explain to people what the dot com era was. Yes. And so we thankfully sold the business. And um, you know, I think AOL needed a radio play, and we were in the right place to make that happen. And at that time, the. Um, at that time, how much um, revenue did you have? And how I mean, big was, was AOL at the time? Yeah, I mean, basically our annual revenue for probably, actually probably our lifetime annual revenue was maybe one and a half million dollars. Hmm. Um, and so I remember when we were um, negotiating with Steve Case, we were trying to figure out, should we go with like just a round number or should we have some like calculated number on the number of users we have? Mm. And we actually ended up coming up with kind of this weird calculation. And so we basically said, you know, 366,500,000. And um, Steve Case came back, how about 320? And we said, okay. And yeah. we just shook hands on that. And wow. it's just crazy how you can make a deal like that so quickly. At the time, AOL was worth... 20 billion, 30 billion? You know, I should know the answer to that, but it, I got to believe it. It was tens even, of billions. Even yeah, more. I mean, I think it was even more than that. 50 cause, maybe. Because they did the merger at the peak, basically, in you know January of 2000 with Time Warner. And they were 50 50. Yeah, and then, so I'm thinking the combined entity was north 100. of 100 billion. Yeah, so it was 50, I think, was probably the number. And they had 35 million subscribers paying at the time, I believe, 25 or $30 a month. So that's what people don't remember about that moment in the internet is that AOL was 30 bucks a month. Right. 35 million members. You're talking they were getting printing a billion dollars a month. It was a, it was plus a big machine. Plus advertising. I mean, it was incredible. And when you put something up on there, they could literally have all 30 million people see it. In, a, in the way that these new walled gardens, Facebook... And YouTube can do that same thing. Yes. Yeah. At an even bigger scale. Yeah. Uh, at some point you decided, hey, I want to be an investor? Or did that just happen? Or did you just stumble into it? I never got the story of how you decided to start a fund and do freestyle and be an investor. Um, so I had a few other entrepreneurial uh, startups and so I grouper, I, I remember grouper which became crackle and sony acquired that yep that was internet video and then i don't know if you've heard me talk about high-tech toilet seats but, oh for sure you know we're number one Brondell. in the number two business brundell yeah yeah um which mark cuban was an investor in mark cuban is an investor yeah, yeah oh, we, we share that also yeah mark was in well no i mean just you had yeah. you had mark as an investor yeah he was he was he owned 15 percent of so, uh weblogs you know so do, so do i um yeah. and so then mark's just, a great partner to have you enjoyed having him as an investor it's honestly i never understand how mark is so connected like if you were to text him a question right now i swear he could probably get back to you very it, quickly it would be under five minutes and sometimes it would be 30 seconds i know i'm like does he have monkeys doing all this in the background no or like, no because just... you know because he puts a space <laughs> after the end of a sentence and then puts a period and i was like mark 
the period goes at the <laughs> end of the word, he would always put a space and an exclamation part in his blog post when he was doing Blog Maverick, which we set up for Mars Software. Yeah. And I would go in and I'd fix it. And he goes, don't fix that stuff because I like it to be like raw, like people know it's for me. It's, it was actually oh. in a, a very Trumpian kind of... Interesting. Like, I want to talk directly. Interesting. And when he didn't resign Steve Nash, he went directly to the public and wrote his own blog post in the same way that 10 years later, like LeBron James is like, I'm going to make my own decision or right. I'm going to announce in my own article, in my own publication. Now all the celeb celebrities make their own publications. Right. And just disintermediate the media. He really pioneered that in yeah. sports specifically. Oh. It's pretty cool. Phasing. Well, I, just on, on a side note with Mark Cuban, I met him for the first time at NAB, NAB which was in April of night. National yeah, April Association of, 19, of Broadcasters. It's a yeah, big conference. TV. TV April of 1996. For TV shows gets and he had what was called broad, no, Audio, Audio Net. Net. Audio and, Net. I, and I had, Spinner used to be called the DJ. And basically, we met at NAB, and he. Um, tried to acquire my company back in 1990, wow. 1996. Incredible. And then I remember going by his office, which was, he had basically a basketball court that was connected to his like living area. Mm -hmm. And basically he had the office in the basketball, sorry, office in the living room area. And then his server farm was in the basketball court. Mm -hmm. And I remember Visiting that in 1996, and, and like, you know he was ahead I of hope his time. The basketball doesn't hit the servers. It all worked out. I mean, we look out. at like one of the best exits. I mean, Cuban had one of the best sure. exits from Web 1.0. Broadcast.com for five billion. Yeah, and it colored and then he co the stock. Beautiful. Explain what happened. What that means. Well, so, so it's sort he, of a critically important moment in the history of. So he so he managed to take Broadcast.com public. Then he managed to sell it, as you said, for $5 billion to Yahoo. And people and don't then, remember, they make fun of it. It had $25 million in the last quarter as a public company, I believe. Right. It I mean, was making money. It was one of the few companies because he was a shark and insistent that if you use his platform, you paid. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then he lost confidence in Yahoo, and mm -hmm. he managed to, instead of, instead of dumping all the stock, which I think he do. probably had locked, yeah, he basically collared it, so he was able to lock in his gains for Yahoo. Right. You know, and collaring for people don't know meant he went to someone like Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan. I don't know who it was. Some bank and said, "I will take." I think the stock was about a hundred or something. He said, "I'll take uh, you know ninety-five to a hundred five right. as my selling range. Right. I'll give up anything above a hundred five, but I'll give up anything below ninety-five. You guys take. You guys give me money. Put the stock into whatever device, and he wound up getting out and making more money than." Many, many people. Maybe even more money than Jerry Yang. Or him and Todd Wagner, his partner, probably made more than Jerry Yang made, ultimately. It was a beautiful transaction. Amazing. And then just one other note on Mark Cuban, then we can talk about other things. But yeah. I continue to love what he's doing with educating Americans with Shark Tank. Like, I actually yeah. sit and watch that show with my kids, and I'm like, this is what I do for real life. Like, yeah. I sit and I hear these pitches, and then I have to ask questions similar to the sharks. And yeah. I think it's great that you have... Um, Americans, similar to what you're doing with this show, just yeah. teaching people about startups and how it works. And so yeah. I think it's great that he's doing that. It's, he's never lost that passion for it, which right. is not a surprise to guys like us who worked with him in the early days. He always had a passion for business and right. always will. But, you know, a lot of people phone it in when they get to that point in their career. They're just like, I'm done. I yeah. don't need to talk to anybody. And it's just nice. It's refreshing to see somebody keep giving back. And yes. I always thought he was a great investor because even though we didn't always see eye to eye on everything, he always had an opinion. Yeah, which is great. Which is great because, you know, a lot of times I find a, a lot of investors are like, oh, uh, you, you come to the – founders come to them with an issue and they're like, that's interesting. I guess there's a lot of different ways you could go about it. Um, let's meet when I'm back from Aspen. And it's just like, <laughs> uh. all right, when we get back from this first quick break, I just want you to tell me how you started Freestyle Capital – and then we'll get into the most important thing, which is how do you pick companies and founders to back when we get back. Ah, yes, Audible. I love Audible because it makes me smarter. And Audible is, of course, the leading provider of audiobooks and spoken word audio products. Their content is unmatched in the world. Their selection of audiobooks is tremendous. And you can access those books anywhere. 
Yes, that's right. iPhones, iPad, Android, Windows, your desktop, wherever you are, you can get your Audible. And the app has tons of great features. One of the great features that people may or may not know about is that you can very easily put it on sleep mode. So when I go to sleep at night, I put my AirBuds in, Apple's AirBuds, I put them in. My wife wants complete quiet, so she's sleeping. I like to go to bed, 30 minutes of an audiobook. I set the timer for 30 minutes, and I drift off to sleep while learning, and it just calms me down uh, when I'm at the end of the night. I love doing that sleep feature. Also, you can speed up. Some authors speak very slowly, and I want them to speak a little bit faster. So I put it at 1.5 so I can consume my content faster. These are some of the great features. The other one I love is when you're listening to an audiobook, you can take a note. Additionally, when you're listening to audiobooks, they now have a killer feature, which is there's a little car icon. I'm looking at it right now, and I just noticed it in the app. And I don't know if they've talked about it, but they have car mode where you click on the car icon and it gives you a nice, big, easy, rewind 30 seconds. You ever have that moment where you're like, that person said something brilliant in this audiobook? Well, with Audible, you just hit that one big, huge 30-second rewind button, and you get to reinforce that learning. And if you were daydreaming and missed it, you can just go boop. And a lot of times, I'll hear something interesting. I said, let me just go back and hear that one more time so I get it. And then you can hit a plus, a bookmark. And what I'll do is, if I'm in a situation where I want to take a note, I hit Siri, I hit the audio text, uh, audio to text, and I write my note. So I just speak my note, save it into the app. It pauses the book while I'm writing the note, then I save it. Or I can hit play and take notes while I'm listening to the book in the Audible app. It also keeps your place. So if you're using your iPad or your iPhone or your desktop, it'll uh, keep that synced. Chapter navigation is super easy. Speed control we talked about. You can even share a book from your library by using Send This Book. They also have channels. This is a new thing that's been around for just a little bit where they have exclusive content, original short stories, comedy, best of news, podcasts, all that kind of stuff. And if you don't like a book, you can easily return it, get an exchange, no questions asked. They have this listener guarantee, which you know I haven't taken advantage of because books are so affordable that I have even thought, you know, I don't even want to return it because I want the author, even though I didn't finish it and care for it, I want them to get a little bit of, of cheddar out of it. But maybe I should. Maybe I should do that. I'm just thinking about it right now. So here's our special offer just for our audience. Get the free audio, get a free audio book at audible.com slash angelbook. Audible.com slash angelbook. You'll get a 30-day free trial membership. And my book of the week, I'm looking at two different books that I listened to recently. One is um, The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly, who was just on uh, This Week in Startups, and he is tremendous, and the book is great. It's an amazing framework for how to think about the future of technology and where the opportunities are. But another book that I've seen all over the place is The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, UCK. And this book by Mark Manson, I don't know who this person is, but it's a pretty interesting book because it does drift into some Tim Ferriss territory, uh, some entrepreneur territory, but it really explains how you can craft a life without all this anxiety that people have. So it's kind of a hodgepodge of different ideas, but I actually didn't think I was going to like it, and I actually turned out I did like the subtle art of not giving an F. It's a, it's a pretty charged title, but I think the book is actually pretty good. I think you're going to get some good things out of it. Uh, so those are my two choices, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F and Kevin Kelly's The Inevitable. That being said, I, am, uh, I just downloaded uh, Anti-Fragile by uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb or Taleb. I can't remember how to pronounce his name, but he's the person who wrote Black Swan. Somebody who read my book, Angel, told me I need to read his book, Anti-Fragile, because it has a lot to do with my betting and gambling strategies. So if you haven't listened to Angel, my book, that's another recommendation. Go ahead and buy that. I actually speak the audio on that book, and we have some great uh, episodes of uh, Angel, the podcast, at the end of that where I do some original content. So thanks again to my friends at Audible. Go to audible.com slash angelbook and get your 30-day free trial membership. Audible.com slash angelbook. Audible.com slash angelbook. I love you, Audible. Thank you so much for sponsoring independent media like Angel the Podcast and This Week in Startups, which you guys and gals over there have been supporting for so long. I truly appreciate it, and congratulations on just keep iterating on the product. Every time I open that app, I find new features I love uh, to go along with the great content library I've built over the years. So thank you again to my friends at Audible for all the support. Let's get back to this amazing episode.
Hey, we're back on Angel the Podcast. Welcome back. You can visit the podcast at angelpodcast.com. And on iTunes, please, please, if you don't mind, go ahead and subscribe. And if you feel so compelled, rate and review the podcast. That's really helpful for us to move up those rankings. So if you authentically feel compelled, I can't tell you to write a review, but I can tell you that if you do, it will help us spread the word about this new podcast. Okay. And when we left our hero, uh, you made a little bit of money from being um, uh, a founder. Rondell, cleaning people's butts. Yes. Amazing. You just went to Japan and saw those incredible toilets and just thought this should be in America? Yes, yeah. Actually, my, my dad, from my graduation from high school, he's like, I'll take you wherever you want to go. And I said, I want to go to Tokyo. Dating myself, this is 1990. Why? Um, because of gadgets, because of technology. I was always a gadget guy. Yeah. I mean, back then, Me Sony was the That was shit. it. You know, Sony, Sony was Apple. Was, Sony was Apple. Like yeah. you, I loved everything Sony, and Sony the was Walkman. from Tokyo. Yeah. And so I was like, I got to go to Tokyo. It was like going to Mecca. Yeah. yeah. It was it's like big. a pro- pilgrimage. But I had never seen these high-tech toilet seats until I got there. And then, you know, traveled numerous times in that decade. And I was like, why is this product does not exist in America? So um, just it on the brand It makes no sense note, that it doesn't. I'm just thinking about it right now. I'm like, why don't I have this at home? And I'm you like, need to have it at home. I'm going to order it when I get, yeah. You know, and, and for kids, it's great also because basically they can stay cleaner. They so. can stay cleaner, get less infections. Yeah. and. Kids sometimes skip a shower some days. They just yeah. fall asleep. And you're like, do I wake this kid up and throw him in the bath? Yeah. Or as a parent, you're like, oh, my God, if I throw him in the bath, they're going to be wired and up for another hour. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a shower in the toilet. It's a shower in the toilet. For people who don't know, yes. these things have become incredibly technologically advanced. Yes. What are some of the features, and we don't want to get too graphic here, but what well, are the, some of the features and what is the core competency of a smart toilet seat cleaner? Well, for, for Brundell, we have the, the primary features are heated seat. So it's oh. like, why do you need to sit on a cold toilet seat? Like it's a heated seat. You have warm water bidet functionality, which is a spray that is both for feminine and for family. So you have two different nozzles. And then we have a dryer. You also mm. have a deodorizer built in to the toilet. And um, some toilets have the auto lift uh, auto closed. We don't have that. We mm. our pro- price point is typically between three hundred to six hundred dollars. Um, and those are when you walk up to it, the seat would rise. Like the Toto Neo Rest is probably like a f- four or five thousand dollar toilet. That's like the four high, high or end. five thousand dollar toilet. That's ridiculous. It's it's an important product, but yes, it's pretty expensive. Um, and so when you do it, what people don't realize is you when you sit on a toilet in Japan. There is a remote control along the side of the toilet, or every, sometimes mounted. Almost every, basically in in Tokyo, you cannot not experience like it is everywhere. everywhere. Every hotel, every public restroom, every every restroom. And so what happens? I have to explain this to some people. Is you, you're sitting, and when you press a certain button, a stick comes out, a water yes. pick essentially. Yes. And it will shoot water on your derriere. That is correct. You can control the temperature of the water. Yes. So you can have very warm, even to hot. Yes. Or cool it down a bit. It can oscillate. And oscillate. Yes. It will move in a certain pattern that will make sure that the water clean. is just clean everywhere. So and just then one other, just, warm just, air as well. That is correct. Just one other, just kind of slightly graphic, but makes a lot of sense, is if you were to go out and fall into mud, mm-hmm. and you were to come back to your house, and, and would you take dry, would you say, can I have some dry paper towel to wipe off the mud? No, you'd say, can I have some water? Right. You'd so want it like, to be fully clean. Yeah. So it's like, why are, why are we using dry toilet paper right. to clean ourselves? So It makes no sense. And then you have this blowing of the hot air. It's always my favorite. You, yeah. The, the, yours blows hot air. Yes. Yeah. So you would be naturally concerned if this oscillating hot water is going all over my undercarriage, as it were. Yeah, but you're, you're totally clean, and then, it's, and then you're blow-dried off. And you blow-dried off, which is a wonderful feeling. I've, yeah. I've experienced this. So we're, you, know, you can find us, of course, on Amazon, but then we're... I, you I'm going to order it today. I'm going to go to the Brondel. Home Depot. I'm going to order the 1,000. There you basin. go. That's the big one, right? The good one? Well, we actually, we've, we, our newest one is the 1,400. The 1400 is out? The 1400. I had no idea. When did that come out? That came out about six months ago. Oh, really? Yeah. And what is the upgrade there? Is there something notable? The primary thing is we've made it smaller. 
Ah. So we've made it so it fits. It fits. I think we fit 95% of all toilet seats in mm -hmm. America now. This is fantastic. I know that Google started putting them in everywhere. Google was before their time with Toto, which was wonderful. Yeah. And I, I really, as with most entrepreneurs, when you start a business, timing is incredibly important. Oh, I started yes. Brundell in 2002. Very I would early. have thought that we would be a lot further along, but it's taken time for the market to, to mature. It's consumer behavior is hard and timing is hard. Yeah. In fact, you were early with your music service. Yes. Because what you built with Spinner would have been Spotify or Pandora. Yes. So Pan if you had, Pandora. If you stuck around for another decade, it could have been a $2 billion company. Right. It could have just kept going. I would not have had the legs to do that. I mean, I was fortunate to basically st start and sell. And then you're like, well, I'm VC, it's longer term. We were talking about, like, how did I start venture? Um, I love being an operator. Mm but I love more not managing anybody. Right. And so I think you probably understand what I mean by that. And I think many entrepreneurs know that where I loved the aspect of having a team. Mm. And let's say at Crackle, which was the internet video, we have a team and we're like, okay, we are going to focus on competing with YouTube, which right. is what we were doing. And, um, and it's nice to have that team aspect of competing. But then as many managers know, when you're managing people, there's a lot of challenges and stress associated with it. And so yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to do it. So People are complicated. With being an, with being an investor, yeah. I can be close to the juice and the excitement of a startup. Right. And I can give my advice and feedback, but I also can go home at nighttime and right. sleep right. and not carry the weight of the company nor the stress associated with managing people. Yeah, it's more fun in a way to be at a company when you're building the product and you're getting it to market. But once you get above, what, 30 people, 40 people? Good point, yeah. Definitely. And that's it why I'm focused on The experience on scene. just changes so much. It becomes arduous when you break 30, 40, 50 people. And, you, and you're starting to spend more time managing people than managing the development and the exploration of the product. Yes. I had the same experience. Yeah. So for Freestyle, um, basically Josh and I co-founded the business, I guess technically in 2009. Yeah. And... Um, the way we started is we were doing angel investing. Mm. We said, why don't we do angel investing underneath an umbrella? Mm. And so we did 20 hundred K investments. So um, we did 20 deals over the span of basically 20 months. And we said, Hey, we like this. And the kind of the three things that we were deciding on with starting freestyle was, do we think we're good at it? And some early bets were good ones. And so we felt like we were Two, This was an important one could we invest in a company and not be the CEO? Could we invest in the company and basically give that company advice, but be okay with that company choosing to go left when we're like, hey, maybe right's the best way. Yeah, We were talking about that a little bit, and that's the one thing that, just going back to Cuban, it's wonderful that he's able to speak his mind and have be opinionated, which is wonderful. Right. You may or may not agree with him, but he has an opinion. And my philosophy at Freestyle is when I'm working with an entrepreneur, I want an entrepreneur that is able to listen to my opinion and not necessarily agree with it, but at least understand it. And if, right. if, the, if the entrepreneur is like, my vision is this way, and I hear what you're saying, Dave, and I, I can see some of the benefits of it, but I still think this way is the best. And I'm like, great, you have let's to, go this way. You have way. to let them go pursue their vision. Yeah, because they have the vision. They gotta do, and they have to do the work every day. Totally. It's yeah. not like you're going to come in and do 12 hours today no. to get them there. I just, back to, I want to have my... I want the entrepreneur to be able to listen to my advice and understand it. And, but it's, I'm fine if they decide to go a different way. And were you always that way? Or in the beginning when you started making the investments where you're like, oh my God, this person's going to flip the car, they're going to crash it into the wall, and they're not listening? It was, it was difficult. And I think as you know with doing these investments, like you know, as you learn more about the team, like the team is so critical with um, you know the overall plan, and so yeah. you really are investing in that person. Typically, a few people that want you know that are agile enough to make decisions on the fly to to change you know possibly the way they're going. Um, so number one, are you good at it? Number two, 
can you let it go? Yes, and I was comfortable with that. And both of those things occurred. And there was a third, you said. I did have a third. Wait yeah. a second. Oh, and then and then basically, you know, can we raise other people's money? Because we were ah. putting our own money to work. Got it. And then the big test is like, you know, will other people give us money? OPM. And other so people's money. Other people's money. And so we started freestyle. We like we had a minimum of hitting twenty million of other people's money, and we um, ended up raising um, twenty six. And so that's was, you know that 30% started over. yeah started in um, that other people's money started in twenty eleven, mm. um, and so um, and very much enjoying it. We were talking about uh, raising other people's money. You get the $26 million fund. And it turns out, hey, this is a great vintage, a great time to start investing because it was post the financial crisis. The stock market had lost half its value. Dow went from, I don't know, 12 or so to whatever, five or six. I don't NASDAQ yes. went from five to, I think, 1,800. I mean, it was brutal. And people thought it was the end of the world. Yes. Uh, and then you've raised a $26 million fund and started to go to work. What was it like to do that? Were you raising that money into the financial crisis or did you finish right after? Well, I guess it was right after, but the challenge was, um, you know, new money managers. Mm. Venture had been hit hard sure. basically twice in the decade because it got hit incredibly hard in the 2000 era and then, you know, hit again in 2008. And, and then the other thing was this whole notion of seed seed venture and sub hundred million dollar funds was all new and so yeah nobody had ever done one were you one of the were you the first or well, who, you really, who the, else had done one I would one? say the god for me I say the godfathers of the seed venture were originally Josh Koppelman at first round capital correct yeah and Steve Anderson at baseline right. and those guys really they started I'm pretty sure in like 2007 2008 and so they saw this before, mm. um, I mean, always had Ron Conway always doing things. Right. Um, the it, spray you know, and pray, $10 million yeah. funds, $20 million funds, but, where he hit Google. Yeah. And a little tiny sliver of Facebook, I understand. Yeah. Um, and so we had to educate LPs, or limited, partners. limited partners, the people that invest with us, like, what is this new asset class? Um, and so we... You know, since I think they understand today that if you have a smaller fund, our fourth fund is is ninety million. We decided to stay south of a hundred because our philosophy is our ability to multiply a sub hundred million dollar fund is easier than you know the five hundred million dollar or billion dollar funds. Right. Um, so that's that was our pitch back in twenty eleven, and that's still our pitch and philosophy today in twenty seventeen. That being smaller allows us to be a little bit more nimble, mm. and bigger multiples. What are the check sizes that you do? And then talk about follow-on investing. Uh, and we'll get into what check size, what stage, and then how you make a decision on those founders as well. So let's talk a little bit about how you get to know the founders, how you make that decision. And then after a year or two, do, when you make that decision to follow on, do bridge financing. So Yeah. So um, because our fund has gone from 26 to 90, we are putting more money to work. And so originally we were putting half a million dollars. When I say originally in like 2011, 2012, we were putting half a million dollars as our initial investment. Today we're around a million when we invest in a company. These seed rounds is, I'm sure you've been, you know, is there's now this notion of pre-seed. And mm -hmm. so there's pre-seed, which for me, I consider to be sub hundred, sub million dollar raise. Which and used to be we, seed. Which used to be seed. And then Freestyle comes in in the when they raise between a million to three, which used to be the Series A. That is correct, um, and so that's where we participate. And then the way our math works is when we put a dollar in the ground, so we put a dollar, a million dollars into a company, we have two million dollars reserved for that company. Um, now, not all of our million dollar investments are going to be are going to work out, but so for not the most part, qualify for that two million. Right, you can't just um, blow the million. Everybody else passes, and right. then they come to you, and you go, "Yeah, no, here's two million to catch the falling knife." Yeah, so that yeah, right, that does not happen. Um, How but, do you make that critical decision? Because this is something that's come up a lot for me personally. Right. Um, hey, we got a lot. We're, it didn't work out. We want to raise more money. Great. Can I do introductions? Great. We do the introductions. Great. Nobody wants to invest. Would you like to bridge the company? 
So how do you handle that conversation and how do you make those decisions? There seems to be three categories. One, it's an undeniable success, a sequoia or a benchmark or social capital is going to do the series A, series B. You're obviously going to plow in that two million, right? Right. But then there's these two others, which is partial traction, let's say, and then no traction. I'm assuming with no traction, it's pretty easy to say, hey, listen, I don't think this business works. It's time to shut it down. Right. Or wrap it up. Uh, but what about that that middle, which I think is the challenging part, for me at least? It is a challenging part. Um, there's this notion of uh, definitely the bridge rounds. And so you have seed, and then you'll hear people saying, well, this is a seed two, or this is a seed three. Seed plus. Seed plus. Um, so we participate in those rounds. Um, and it's really it's really just on a case-by-case -case basis. And so the primary thing Walk that- Walk through that, one, yeah. Well, the primary thing that I look at when, when we invest, setting aside team and all these other things, I guess I would say two things. One is because I've been an entrepreneur and started companies previously, <clears throat> I like to think about whether I could be a co-founder of this business with this founding team. Oh, so wow. it's one way I think about it. It's like, can I be I love that test. excited to work with these people closely? Can I be excited about the mission that they're solving? And, and so, so it's that's a gut one. Thing. It's, it's like kind of putting a, yourself into this scenario, yes. which isn't real. Right. But would I be stoked to be the co-founder or president or VP of marketing at this company? Right. So that's one thing. What a great test. So thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm, we, we like that one. That's one that we work on. And then the second one is really... And that was actually a question I just followed up with um, an entrepreneur today on due diligence I'm working on. It's like, I want to understand, let's say you have the two million bucks in the bank October 1st. Tell me your goals for your business October 1st, 2018, one year from today. And do I think A, those goals are realistic? And B, do I think those goals allow you to raise ah. a Series A financing? So what will the use of capital be? Right. And explain to me if that will qualify you, since the first million didn't, right. to getting to that Series A. Yes. So those are the, you know, there's many other checkboxes, team, product, TAM, total addressable market, is this thing large enough? But those are ones that I focus on that might be a little bit different than other investors. Let's talk about the first check, go back to the million. What makes an investment intriguing when you meet with a founder or I forge you something, you read the deck, what are things that you in, just pique your interest and say, I got to dig deeper. I got to know more and make you, let's say, prime the pump a bit for, hey, this could be a, you know, a freestyle company. So I think Jason, you probably get like a tremendous amount of deal flow. And sometimes, honestly, and I'll tell this to entrepreneurs, is, is there's so much activity out there that so, sometimes we just have to make like a quick gut decision. It's just right. like, your deck looks great. I appreciate the problem that you're solving. It's a good problem to solve. I just don't have the personal conviction to do it. And so how do you, like, how do you encapsulate that into a specific filter? It's hard right. to necessarily encapsulate. Not for me. It's, it's just, that one's not for me. Right. Now, like one of the deals I did is actually sitting across the office from you. Their, their office is right there. Here and, this, work, and, <laughs> and this deal um, is um, focused on workers comp. Like, I don't know much about workers comp, but I wanted to have Personally, I wanted to have an investment within the insurance vertical, and I looked at why. I just felt I feel that basically that industry needs innovation and technology and transparency. Yeah. It's a massive industry, and so I looked at car insurance. That one's a little bit. It was a little bit late to come into that. I yeah, looked into all house insurance. Mile ones had taken off. Yeah, so then I looked into house insurance, and then I actually didn't know much about workers' comp because within within traditional software we don't have workers comp per se, yeah, but carpal tunnel. <laughs> yeah. But it is, I mean, it is a little bit, but yeah, basically it's not for, like construction or being a, f a, a firefighter. Right. And so workers comp is, is a massive multi-billion dollar um, industry and it's very regulated. And so anyway, so like why do that deal? Well, that was just kind of like, I wanted to have an insurance play and I like the team and I said, you know, I'm going to do that deal. Um, so I think as you probably appreciate many times, you just kind of have to go with your gut because there's so many different, so many different people are asking you for money, basically. Right. And 
there's not that much data in the early days. It's right. one of the challenges of our business is that, you know, if you're a publicly if you're publicly trying to evaluate Facebook, you can look at their revenue per user for the last, you know, you can do revenue per daily active user, revenue for monthly active users. I mean, there's all different ways to skin the cat and how right. it's changing and what percentage it's changing, earning per share, all this different data. Uh, with our companies, not much data. It's so a gut. There's a lot of gut. What other types of qualities do you look for in a founder? Like when we start getting to that sort of personal, you're looking at the founder and you're saying, you know, for me, I, I look for people who are passionate about the idea and that I feel have some sort of craftsmanship. They, they just know how to make product. I'm, I'm, I just like well-built product for some reason. Yeah, no, I think that's important. Um, of the, I think we've done close to 90 deals at Freestyle <clears throat> and most of them are teams. Mm. And so the solo founder is, I think, rare mm. today. Uh, and so I think having a team is important. I typically ask, like, how long have you known your team members? And so it's great when they have, you know, been working together at a previous gig or they have experience working together because as we know, the startup is incredibly stressful. Um, and so I like, you know, if, if possible, if the team has been working together for some time, that's great. So if it's three people out of Google or two people who were together at Stanford or yeah. they both worked in sales at LinkedIn, hey, yeah. this, this means you, you, you have some uh, ability to get through the hard times together with an esprit de corps or something. Yeah. And then typically you've got a technical co-founder because they're able to build some prototype or version of their product without having any capital. Right. Because um, it, and that it is critical. So like we're, you know, we're not going to do a deal. We're not going to do a PowerPoint deal where the founders are still employees elsewhere. Like, no, if you're going to do this deal, you need mm. to, you need to jump. You need to jump right. from it's scary. It is scary. I appreciate it's scary, but you need to jump and say, you know what? I'm committed to this and I'm going to, you know, work on this for six months bootstrapping right. and, uh, and then be able to raise capital. And really, I feel like the it's model... It's kind of a litmus test, isn't it? It is a litmus test. And I feel like the model is fair where basically we as investors are paying a higher pre-money value. So we're paying... We're paying... Um, we're, we're buying things that are more expensive, but that entrepreneur has also demonstrated their willingness to devote time and energy to the company. And so I, I think the model is... Um, you know, I think it's a fair one. Yeah, I find it's very interesting when when people have very low self-awareness that if you say to an investor, I'm willing to start this project provided I uh, you give me money. And that's the starting pistol for me. Yeah. It's the biggest turnoff in the world. It, it means okay. you have no conviction about it. Yeah. When you started Spinner, you just needed to see that exist in the world. When I started Weblogs Inc., I just needed to disrupt traditional publishing and I had to do it and it didn't matter if anybody was coming along for the ride or not. Totally. I remember telling my parents like, cause I was working at Oracle yeah. and the, and I told them, yeah, I'm, I'm quitting and I'm starting this internet quitting radio. Oracle. Yeah. And they're like, wait, Dave, what, wait, what is this internet thing? <laughs> and obviously it all paid out, paid off well, but yeah, I, I mean, were you in the you Oracle know? like sales training craziness? I was, I've heard legendary stories about that. I was, I was not, I was a geek at MIT. Ah, so okay. I was in building oh, 300. Yeah. Undergrad or master's? Or? Undergrad. So really? graduated there in 94, worked with at what? Oracle. Um, double E. Wow. And, then, and then somebody wisely said, which I still agree with today, that starting a software company is easier than a hardware company. And sure so when is. I went to work at Oracle, I actually didn't know, not, I didn't know a lot about software. I knew more about hardware. Hmm. Um, but then Netscape went public in August of 95. This is a long time ago. Yeah. But that was kind of the birth of the internet. And so that right. was when I jumped in to Spinner soon after. We just had Jim Clark on the program. Oh, yeah. It was so trippy. You know, he still codes every day. Really? He's like, yeah, I code every day for like two hours, some days four hours, some days eight hours. He's like literally built his own home automation system for his home. It's beautiful. And he's on the show here showing the software. And he's like load up, it, you know, he's, he's raising the garage doors in his house in West Palm Beach or wherever the heck it is. And, and I'm sitting here going, billionaire is writing code every day. I mean, it's just so charming and alluring and that's beautiful i mean he was one of the godfathers of the internet and then you get to people who want who say i'm an idea person 
they have no ability to craft anything. It to me is such a red flag if you when I ask people what their skills are today, they say, Well, I'm an idea person. And I'm like, So so are the other five billion people <laughs> on planet Earth or whatever it is today. Yeah. yeah. Well the other thing I like to think about is is for me, I think the idea it's, itself is probably like ten percent of the mm. investment. Like, cause whatever idea you happen to be working on, there are other people working on that idea. Mm. And just one other note, like sometimes people say, we have no competition. I'm like, if you have no competition, then it's most likely not necessarily a very good idea because you like competition is good. Like it's a, you know. There should be some competition. Yeah. And you should be displacing somebody. Yeah. I think found, you know what's happened a lot? When we were founders, there wasn't this weird uh, I'm going to try to game the investor. So I'm going to optimize what I'm doing to trick or otherwise induce an investment. Right. Which there seems to be this escalation of tactics to manipulate investors, which I was unaware of until I went onto the other side of the table. But in the beginning, it was just like, here's my idea. Is it cool? Let's play with it. And right. do we all want to make this happen? But now that there's so much more competition like exploding term sh sheets or I don't know, rat not exploding term sheets from the investors. I'm talking about ratcheting up valuations. I don't know if you've seen this one. Yeah, it, kind of why combinator ask where, oops, sorry. Oh, no within problem. One hour within, um, yeah. yeah, like within one hour, my valuation is going to go from 12 to 14. Because? Because it's an hour later and the company is one hour more, uh, one hour older. And right. Before, Oh, I it's see. So expensive. 60 minutes, $2 million. I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, anyway. We're going up $35,000 $35, an hour in value yes. <laughs> per yeah. minute. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, I literally had That's a company crazy. from my company. It was like, the valuation if you get in this week is six, but next week's eight or whatever. It's two weeks. I said, what is that based on? Like, well, we're, we have an engineer starting next week or two new yeah. engineers starting and yeah. Google pays a million dollars per engineer. I was like, um, if, they're, <laughs> if they're engineers in AI, and self-driving cars, maybe, but right. what are we talking about here? Like, uh, or that it had it, it's closing now, so I don't have time yeah. to meet with you. Yeah, that was the other weird one I got from a Y Combinator company. Was I said, okay, great, I, I'm really interested. I think this is fascinating. It was really, you guys have done a great job. Um, here's my assistant. Like, uh, you know, she'll get back to you, and uh, we'll set up coffee. And they're like, when tomorrow? I'm like, no, I got some stuff on my plate. I got travel. I got this thing. Uh, but I. You know, just talk to her. And they're like, well, it's closing. I'm like, okay. And they're like, well, are we not meeting? I'm like, we can meet. Maybe the next round. I don't know. But I, whatever we can, whatever my schedule allows, I'll meet with you. But, you know, like. Yes. It, you really are going to close the round. And you really want me as an angel investor. But we, we can't schedule a meeting. It was yeah. so weird. That is a little weird. It got a little weird. I, you know what? It, it seemed like there was a period of time where there was a resentment of investors taking advantage of founders. I never felt that too much when we were coming up, but I, I guess there was some period of that. You hear some, some people say, oh, you're on the dark side. Like, I don't know why people say that, but it's weird. I find it weird. Um, I don't yeah. feel like I'm on the dark side. Uh, think, you know what I think it is, is historically, I think Paul Graham had a bad experience with investors so, you know, everything's always top down in every right. organization. So I think because he might have had a bad experience with investors or seen some early bad behavior, he always wanted to disempower or neuter any possibility that the investors would screw with the YC companies, which I think I, I think understand he had good intent. Right. But it just got taken to a, a level of manipulation and trying of trickery right. that just felt inauthentic and silly. It doesn't, it doesn't create the alignment. What do you think about governance? So you're putting in larger checks now mm -hmm. and you sometimes these are convertible notes, but I mean, when you start putting in these kind of checks, you probably want to know what the share price is and be able to buy so, it. So we are, yeah, we're not doing convertible notes, but for governance, it is an interesting dilemma. We were talking a little bit about um, Uber previously. And um, so Freestyle's philosophy is at least within the seed stage, if it's hard for me as an investor to necessarily butt heads with the founder because I'm not going to take over the business because I, I have a, you know, a seed position in it. So our philosophy is we must align our incentives with the founder. And, um, and so we're, we don't have a lot of like board governance at the seed level. It typically, we kind of just, 
push that to the Series A, and then for most all Series A term sheets, you know, the Series A investor comes in with right. um, with a board seat. So but that's kind of our philosophy. We do price around and get off the convertible we do, note. Nonsense. We do price we do Play price around because we've had we've had some challenges previously previously with the safe. Like I'll just explain one thing that happened is, is there were two founders on a convertible note and one of the founders left and, and then the other founder got all the equity, but I'm like, well, we invested in two of you. And that was kind of how we kind of came up with what we thought was a fair value for the business yeah. with the note. And yeah. so, um, and, and so now that was I've one got a single founder. I have a single founder. Why should that other founder get all of it? It should dilute. Everybody should, re, the, it, those shares should just get, back into the pool. Yes. Well, they should be eliminated. They were never vested. They go back into employee stock corruption pool for the next group of employees. Yeah. So it was it But it increases weird, everybody's position it was, as it opposed was, to just theirs. Correct. Yeah. So that was one thing that happened. Um, and then just another thing is, is you've heard this also where if you raise a lot of debt and then you actually do an equity round, it's just hard for the founder many times to like basically have a huge equity haircut at a single point in time. I know it's kind of a weird mental thing, right. but still it's like, it's just sometimes a huge stomach ache. And so our philosophy is for pre-seed, it's fine to do notes. Um, but when we participate, all of our term sheets are a you know, simple term sheet, but it's a price round. And yeah, I, I, you know, I never thought about the double emotional whack of, I gave away 30% of my company in the seed, in the seed right? and then, or in the pre-seed, pre -seed, and, and then I'm giving away another 30% in the seed, and 30 and 30, I mean, this is like, oh my goodness. It all, yeah, it all comes together at a single point. Right. And now, I somebody's got to go through the cap table and go, oh boy, here's some, real, here's some really, here's some difficult medicine to swallow. Yeah. And then for a chaser, here's some, some more difficult medicine to swallow. It's really like doing two shots back to back. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I saw that was really troubling to me was um, the number of safe notes piling up at different valuations. Right. And caps. Yeah. And then different people paying different prices, but in different orders. So not, yeah. so going up, 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 up to 12 and then back down to eight and then back up to nine, and then somebody else got in. At the, and then nobody knows that different people were paying different prices, and these are all naive new angels who don't ask for the cap table and all the other documents and every other safe note to read it. Right. And I said, hey, how do will all these people feel when the person who bought it for 14 knows this other person bought in for eight yeah. after them? Yeah. And they're like, well, they're not going to know unless they review the cap table, whatever, but eventually, you know, whatever, we'll have to deal with it. But that's the, le that's the docs they signed. Right. And I'm like, the docs they signed is a different moral, ethical concept or conceit than um, I'm going to do right by my partners. Right. Right. And I think that's mm -hmm. where you start, people start to lose the, the script. And then also... People are starting, when they convert these, they have to convert multiple, they have like seed one, seed two, seed three, seed four. So you have multiple classes of shares and they're like, it gets really messy, these cap tables. Yeah. So, I mean, my philosophy is when we go out for series A, we want to have, you know, clean. a clean cap table and clean. a clean debt structure, which yeah. is typically no debt. No, no more debt. Yeah. No more debt. debt. Yeah. Uh, interesting. And so... One thing that's come up a lot with early stage investors is the Series A investors looking at folks like yourself or myself early on and thinking, uh, these guys got a pretty great deal. We're going to maybe not run roughshod over them, but they're going to lose some rights or, you know, um, maybe they try to mess with your rights. Mm -hmm. Have you had that happen with Series A investors where they're like, hey, we want to take away information rights, we want to take away your pro rata, we want to take away this or that? And then if so, how have you dealt with that? You can give us an example if you want to mask you know, the, the actual people in it involved, but broad strokes. Yeah. Well, I think, um, so for definitely for the hot deals um, where there's multiple term sheets um, coming in for a Series A, it's uh, not... Typically, not all seed investors will be able to do their pro rata in a Series A, and so we have had instances where we, um, you know, we 
we wanted the deal to happen and we were like, okay, we got in at the seed. We would like to be able to get another 2 million in the A, which from a legal perspective, we had the rights to do it. But from, uh, I guess, a tactical deal perspective, we said, okay, we know for the most part, the Series A investors have it pegged between on the low end, maybe 16%, but most likely closer to 20, as we know, or 22. And so they, for their structure to work, they want to have that percentage. Just and, saying, I want you know, 20%. I want 20% post. Right. And so... Um, and there's only $3 million. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. There's um, only $3 and, million dollars to, to, uh, to go, go to around. Pro- yeah. So we've mm. had challenges with that. And, and so, you know, we... And so in those instances, we have not been able to put our full pro rat in, but we're... Um, so you just be reasonable. You have the conversation with the founder, you have the conversation with the VC or everybody? We're ty- we typically go directly just with the founder right. on, um, on managing that. So you say we'll step out of the way a bit to let yes. them come in? If, you know, if, if we're excited about the Series A investor as, as a partner. Hey, let's go through your portfolio. Things that uh, we'll start with things that are big wins that you feel really great about. Tell us some of the ones that you feel hopeful about and you're yeah. thrilled. And then we'll get into regrets and we've Wonderful. all had a few. Um, well, I think uh, a, a fun one deal is um, that's within the B2B space is Intercom. And so, oh inter- my God, you did Intercom? Yeah. And actually then, and Social Capital did the A. Oh my God, that's on a tear. Yeah. I love Des Trainer. He yeah. is one of the great mentors and speakers we've had in all of our events. Oh, really? Fantastic. Yeah. No, he's Des a wonderful Trainer, product person. Great. That product um, is so, amazing. They're, I mean, one of the fastest growing SaaS companies. Top 10 fastest growing SaaS companies right now is what I, I hear. I very much like it. I mean, we got, we yeah. got lucky. And just on that note. So you like, did the seed round. We did the seed round. And so, so it was what, a $10, $20 million company or something in that range? Oh, it was sub, you know, we invested with sub 10. Oh. <gasps> Oh my yum yum! Yeah, yeah, that's gonna be no, that huge. Was, that's gonna be a billion dollar company. I I hope and believe so. Yeah, no, oh, we're excited sure. about that. Yeah, they're um, on a tear. It's an Irish company. It is. Yeah. So how did you meet Des Trainer and the team over there? You know, that was a five hundred startups, um, oh. and so it was a five hundred startups deal, and I um, saw the pitch, and then the way it came back in the fold was I saw three or four pitches of people showing me their intercom dashboard. Mm. And and then I was like, wait, I keep on seeing this intercom dashboard. Yeah. I'm like, I appreciate what you're showing me, but I'm actually going to call Owen from intercom because yeah. I keep on seeing his dashboard in these pitches. Yeah, it's like seeing, <laughs> seeing a startup show you Stripe. Right. And yeah. you're like, huh, why is everybody using Stripe? Yeah. What is this Stripe thing? <laughs> He's like, take that little note in your moleskin. <laughs> like, and it's the, the poor founder thinks you're taking notes about them when in yeah. fact you're taking a note to follow up about this other startup that they're, they love. It's a, it's a kind of a funny moment. Yeah. Uh, well, so, that's fantastic. That's so that's a actually, a, I mean, that's going to be a big, that'll be the biggest win out of 500 startups. I mean, previously it was I, Twilio. Right. Which I think is worth a billion and a half. I'm not sure what it's worth in the public market right now. They went public pretty early. Right. Um, but I, I could easily see Intercom eclipsing Twilio. I mean, I love I, Twilio. I hope but, so. That's going to yeah. be amazing for you. Gonna well, be, thank you. That'll be a dragon for that fund. Is that in the 26 would, or the that's, 90? That's in the 2011. That's fun one. Wow. Another, I mean, we have a few good ones. Um, another fun one company is a company called Airtable. I don't know if yeah, you, you've of course. Met. Howie would actually be great for the show. Yeah, he's a, he's I, a, I know Airtable. He's Explain a to people what they do and how wonderful. you found them. Yeah, so Airtable, interestingly enough, Howie, a Duke graduate, he was our first intern at Freestyle. So in 2010, when he was a senior at Duke, he worked on models for Josh and I, and then he actually came out and worked at, I don't know if you remember, Crowdflower. So Lucas Bewald, who's another of kind of you know, geeky tech Crowdflower entrepreneur. Crowdflower launched at Launch Festival, yes. and they were doing, um, it was sort mechanical of a better version Turk. of Amazon Turk. Yeah, be- Mechanical Turk, better version, yes. And so How'd actually, that do? It's still doing great, right? Printing that was money? actually our first seed investment. So wow. when you go back to... The 20 deals that Josh and I did, the first one we did was into Crowdflower. Wow. So anyway, how we went to work for, for Lucas, and then he started a Y Combinator company called Etax that um, Salesforce acquired. And then he was like, I think I could do Salesforce better on a, on a global scale with a better software stack. And so Airtable has some of his learnings from 
um, Salesforce, but really it's basically a better merge of a database and a spreadsheet. And People it's just a, crazy for our table. It's a, it's how we manage freestyle. So we manage all of our deal flow, all of our portfolio on Airtable. Database table. plus spreadsheet. So if you're using a spreadsheet as a database, which many people do, yes, or a CRM, which many people do, yes, you can do funny, a fancier, slicker, databasey type stuff with it. Yes, it's got a great interface for both web, but then it has a great interface for for interfacing Airtable via the phone. It's a little bit of phone. onboarding time to get like into that brain set. It's like yes, because it's this new hybrid. Yes, because you've been stuck um, in the Excel, but forty year. You know, just their, their numbers, their engagement numbers are through the roof. I mean, once they kind of, once once you basically get into the system and understand it, it's a wonderful platform. So, um, you're also in Patreon. Patreon. I mean, that's that makes me feel good from both an investor financial perspective, but then I want artists to be able to make money, mm. and even similar to doing what you do, which is podcast, like and- help so many entrepreneurs out there. I want you to be able to make a living doing sure. it. I don't know if you're on Patreon, but it's just as a reminder that the idea is that artists are able to have patrons sign up for their art. And typically these artists are creating content maybe on a weekly basis, maybe on a monthly basis. And I may pay $5 to an artist and I get some Kickstarter-esque like mm benefits from that. But it's just this wonderful circle of artists to be able to do what they do and fans be able to pay the artist. Directly. Direct, on a directly. reoccurring revenue basis. Interesting. Yes. When we started this podcast, we started something called Twist List and we just created a listserv and said if you want to be the executive, if you want to be a producer or executive producer of the show, we'll put you in the credits. So right. in the early episode, we would put you in the credits. Oh, yeah. And you would pay $5 a month to 100 bucks a month and people would pay. Right. And it was yeah, that hilarious. Was early Patreon. And it was like an early kind of conceptual version of Patreon. And mm-hmm. we got to five or so thousand a month. And I was like, this is incredible. We're going to be able to hire a producer or you know, a full-time person. And it right. was great. But then advertising kind of gave us escape velocity. There weren't a lot of tools to do this. And um, I think that's where Patreon really made it more systematic that you could like do this. And there's people on there who have tens of thousands of dollars per month. Yes, and I remember one guy left, Tom Merritt, who was working for Leo Laporte doing This Week in Tech. He was mm-hmm. doing like his daily tech show, and then he left Leo to just do his own. He wanted to do it in a different city. And I think he makes fifteen or 20000 a month. And he did this very cool thing for his podcast that uh, Tom Merritt was very interesting. If I get to this level, I'm going to add this correspondent. So if I get to... I get to from 14 to 16, I'll add Veronica Belmont, a great broadcaster, journalist, to say, hey, we'll have her on three days a week. Yeah. So we'll pay her whatever, 250 or 500 to come on and prepare her little segment. And it, w- it really motivated the audience to sort of hit those other milestones and have access to them. It was very clever. It's a, it's a great viral model. Just, just on, a, on a related note, it's interesting because these – you, most of the clips you'll find on YouTube and basically at the end of the clip, it's like, hey, you know, sign up for Patreon. So it's basically, mm. you know, a viral model yeah. of getting customers to sign up. And so what's great is it makes you so independent of the other platforms. So you're independent of YouTube's whims because Af- YouTube all right. of a sudden said, you know what, PewDiePie is like doing Nazi and saying the N word or whatever. Like the number one guy is just going crazy. All the advertisers. This, what's that? I don't know this, but yes. Okay. So there's a guy, PewDiePie, who's the okay. number guy, number one. He's the guy who does the Minecraft no. videos. Oh, okay. Okay. He has 50 million subscribers, but he went oh, kind of doing a little, he was doing really there. racy, crazy stuff. Like, mm. you know, having people hold up, he, he just did really like pranks that were really like in very poor taste and, and racisty, kind of anti-Semitic, Nazi, mm. bizarre, like, you know that troll humor where they're like, Nazis are funny and we're going to just, you know, it's like, yeah. they're just like, kind of. they're just like these weird internet meme type stuff. Anyway, he started engaging in that kind of stuff and the advertisers were like, we're really not interested in Nazis in right. the video, so, or the N-word, so maybe you could take that out. So, right. But anyway, it had this ripple effect throughout YouTube where they said, from now on, uh, we're not going to let these type of videos that have these kind of words really? get, get advertising. And hmm. we're going to stop 
if your video doesn't hit 10,000 views, we're not going to put ads in it. So they just, mm -hmm. so if you did something right, right. with violence in it, it could even be something as simple as like, I'm talking about a terrorist attack. They would just be like, that's not appropriate for an advertiser. You know, right. Ivory Soap does not want to be in front of an ISIS debate video right. or right. whatever. So all of a sudden, all these creators got rounded up in this, you know, bad behavior of a few, mm. and it just demolished the YouTube ecosystem for a whole swath of creators, and that drove a bunch of them to Patreon. Right. And saying, you know what? I don't want to have a, a YouTube dependency. If YouTube's going to change the rules right. with no warning and we lose our advertising, we need to have two, mo two or three revenue streams. So merchandise became one, right. Patreon and other ones. And now everybody's copying Patreon. Hey, we got a Twitter question from Brian Jiribon. Jiribon. Uh, sorry for butchering the name. How much time do you allocate on new deals versus portfolio companies? An interesting question. That is a great one. So, I mean, typically it's 50, 50. Mm. Um, and so, um, we, we were, I was kind of in charge of our fundraise. And so that took a third of my time. So it was kind of a third, a third, a third, but for the most part, I split it 50, 50 and, um, we, you know, have similar to you, probably lots of deal flow coming in the front door. Um, but then my goal and commitment to my existing portfolio companies is to have, you know, a lot of time and availability for them during their first year life cycle. So when we invest, we're focused on helping them during that first year. Intercom, as example, when Social Capital did the Series A, I became less involved with the business and kind of handed the baton to um, Mamoon, who joined the board yeah. um, at Social Capital, I mean at Intercom. And you don't take board seats ever? We, I am. Are on, you rethinking that now because of the bigger size fund size? I am still. We. I am still comfortable with there being a solo founding board for seed rounds for me personally, hmm. um, just because. Back to. I need to. I may disagree with the founder in some instances, but I'm also. Not gonna be able to fully kind of like take the reins of a startup at that early stage. I mean, it's really the founding team needs to be able to carry it. So um, there's some instances that I, I joined the board, I guess for the company that's actually across the hallway from you, you I am on the lot, board. By the way, if you um, actually, they haven't announced it. So okay, I'll just, no. you know, so, but, quiet. but I'm on the board of that one, right. uh, but other instances, I'm not on the board. Yeah. Hey, uh, after a hundred investments, you must have learned some things that if you could transport yourself back in time, you would and just whisper in your ear, don't do this or change things up a bit or here's a better approach to being a great investor in these early stage companies. What are the things that you would tell your younger self back in 2009? That's a good one. Um, I guess, you know, two things come to mind. One of them is not anything new because I think it's a challenge within the whole market, but the B2C market is so difficult today, which I'm sure you can appreciate where basically just as an example, musically, I'm not sure if sure. you're familiar with that. I thought that that could possibly be a breakout um, uh, deal because it was very popular within my household. Um, I have four kids and they were always doing musically, but the finicky consumer and the power of, um, I guess, Facebook and some of the big guys, like they can kind of just kind of cut wow. off, you know, cut them off when they see growth um, for a particular B2C deal. So me, me being a B2C entrepreneur, I'm challenged and scared by the fact that it's difficult to do B2C investments, but it's also, they're just so risky. And so anyway, it's the just, you know, so low. It really is so, yeah. It can pay off if it becomes Facebook or Twitter or whatever, but it's just so hard to build an at scale B2C company. It's, and now you have this weird aberration that didn't exist before, which is Facebook, which is absolutely willing to study people's use of their graph. Right. Then pixel by pixel copy them. Yeah. In a way that we would have considered in our era to be uncouth unethical, immoral, uh, disgusting, d depending on who you are, I, I find it flat out disgusting that 
Zuckerberg can tell everybody, get over your pride and just your ideas don't matter. What matters is Evan Spiegel's ideas. And then to use the data that they tried to convince startups was in their best idea to use Facebook Connect, use our graph. Right. And then they studied the graph usage. Right. And cut off their own, one of their own alumni, Dave Morin, when he started to get some traction with Path, and then stole from Dave Morin after cutting him off his really elegant innovation of you could hover over and instead of just giving a like, give a heart, a, a sad, a cry, they just stole it from him right. after killing his company. What is it, how, have, how does an entrepreneur approach an ecosystem with a marauding, moralist, I'm saying this, not you, brutal competitor like Zuckerberg who does not care about his own employees' ideas and is m more than willing to just steal the best ideas from young startups we invest in. How do you feel personally about it? I don't know if I, I, don't know if I can answer that question, but I, I will just say that... How do you feel being, about it? Well, it is challenging being a B2C entrepreneur today. And so... Um, <clears throat> You know, we've we've we continue to make B two C investments. My gut is that for Fund Three, we'll end up probably thirty five percent B two C, sixty five percent B two B. And the B two Cs can you know be breakouts. And so we're in a deal called Wag, which is Wag Walking, which is Uber for dog walking. You're like, well, really? But it's actually the numbers are through the roof. And they have a tremendous amount of loyalty of, for allowing people access to their home to let yeah, their dog out for a walk. Relationship. It's, it is. For people, it's the same as their child. If you don't have kids and you have a dog, yeah. it is the same for you as a child. Now, once you have your kids, your dogs go back to being <laughs> animals. Yes. You, you, you look still, at them slightly differently. You do, but still. But like, it's still a cherished Thing. When you're, it's like six o'clock, you're like, oh, I'm supposed to walk fluffy. Oh, you know what? If I can just do wag walking. And so anyway, wags is a B2C deal that's, you know, through the roof, but. Congrats it's, on that. Thank you. We're excited about it, but we're, but it's challenging being a B2C entrepreneur. So I, I wish I had better advice for you B2C entrepreneurs um, because I was one yeah. um, and I want to continue to see innovation there. Um, so but hard. I don't know what this, I don't know what the solution is. I really hope that's some. Thing breaks at Facebook because I feel like their reign of terror and like ethical marauding is a, a real wet blanket on innovation. I, I don't think the United States would ever do antitrust on them, but I do think the EU needs to take a deep look at Facebook's use of the graph. Yeah, I, it's an area that I don't know well, a lot about. Well, think about this. I have some inside information. I'll float it here for the first time. If this is conspiracy theory. Okay. But I'm known for floating conspiracy theories that three to six months later no longer feel like conspiracy theory and start to feel like fact. Okay. Here's a conspiracy theory. We would love for you to benefit from the social graph. Use Facebook Connect and save a ton of time. Just put this little SDK in your, in your app or your website. Now we know how often and in fact how people are using your product. Mm -hmm. And you may perceive that it's just connecting them. But we may have some other hooks in there. And I'm, this is a conspiracy theory that is floating around that we could actually study on a feature-by-feature -feature basis how people are using your product. So we may know if you log in with, you know, uh, Path, that the feature that Dave created of the like mm -hmm. is the killer feature. Right. So not only are we going to know who's using your product, what demographics, and how many, we are going to be able to study what features work. Then we're going to be able to take those same users, since there are users as well, and we're going to be able to, and this has been proven, um, market to them our new beta products mm. that are mimicking your own. So there's this new collaborative, I don't know if it's called party down or party, some, some group video chat. Oh, house party. House, house party. party. Greylock back. Greylock. Also popular in my household. Okay. So here's what happened. There's a story out about house party and Facebook mm. that is really nasty. Mm. Um, they're building their own clone of house party. And what they did was 
they went, according to these reports, and who knows what's true, they have their own house party. It would make sense that Facebook would have that. They marketed to house parties user that were, a house party was that naive enough to use, to use Facebook Connect, mm. and they marketed to those people to try the new product. So if you partner with Facebook as a startup, and I said this when Paul Graham brought them into Y Combinator, I said, you have to get your head examined. You're not letting the fox into the hen house. You're moving the hen house into the fox cave. Like you're literally picking up all your entire hen house and saying, let's relocate this in the fox den. Right. That's the analogy. Yeah. Par and there is nobody who partners with Facebook who does not wake up with their throat slit. So there's a message to founders. If you use Facebook Connect, you are handing your data to a competitor who does not have any morals or ethics around respecting the art and creation of other peers. And what they did, stealing every single thing Evan Spiegel has done, and then putting it into every single product, I believe is the most uh, nefarious and disgusting thing you can do in entrepreneurship. I personally believe that. Now, it's one thing to build on another person's ideas, obviously. Right. You know, that, that's how progress is made. But wholesale stealing combined with using data that you got under false pretenses and then using your ad network to then kill the customer base of a startup, this to me seems anti-competitive to a level that is actionable. It may not be actionable by our weak antitrust here in the United States, but it's certainly actionable by the hyperactive filter of the EU. Right. And it's certainly addressable by litigation by a group of startups should they choose to do it here in the United States. Hmm. Yeah. If a group of 20 startups who have used Facebook Connect then been kicked off of Facebook Connect, which right. we all know many, right. there's a list out there of those. If somebody got that list of Facebook Connect companies that were murdered by Facebook right. and then demanded to see in discovery, the internal communications and the data that was taken, right. this would be actionable, I believe. Hmm. Yeah. I was just floating a theory here. Listen, you and I have companies that may wind up selling to Facebook someday. We want right. to have good relationships with Facebook. I think Facebook is a bad actor. A bad, that's what I personally believe. Bad actor for the ecosystem. Right. I think that they are yeah. doing exactly what antitrust was designed to prevent, which is stifling innovation and competition. Well, I do know that House Party was and is innovative, and so I've not seen the article. And, and yeah, given the only, the only interesting thing just on Facebook that Facebook is not in my household for my kids. And so it'll be interesting to see how, you know, Facebook goes after the younger generation. But that's an, another discussion also. Well, yeah, it does seem to be going down for that group of people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a Wall Street Journal article. The new copycat. The new copycats. How Facebook squashes competition from startups. You can see it here. Oh, okay. Tiny right. house party. It's a promising video. Da, 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 and they noticed. Wow. Um, yeah. Facebook is being aided by an internal early bird warning system that identifies potential threats, according to people familiar with this technology. As so, I said, I think that's kind of like musically was, you know, flagged as like, wow, look at all this activity. So they have a so lot. So here's of, the message. Know. If you take Facebook Connect out of your product is what we all have to tell the entrepreneurial community and do not participate in any way with Facebook's ad network or Facebook on any level as an entrepreneur. Do not meet with them until you actually want to sell your company, you have multiple offers, you meet with them last maybe to put the best price in or something. Right. But I don't think you should ever meet, as my advice to every founder is do not meet with a Facebook executive. If, if they invite you over, do not meet with them. Just say you're, you're not interested or not that at this seems, time. Yeah, it seems like And do advice. not use Facebook Connect. If, you have, if you're using Facebook Connect and you're, if you're next door and you have Facebook Connect, you should rip it out. I mean, I, I would log into Facebook to next door with Facebook, and I'm like, I, I, are, is next door crazy? They're just going to steal it. Right. All right, listen, Dave, this has been amazing. We could go for three or four hours, but you've got to get back to work. And yes. I am bringing up uncomfortable conspiracy theories here at the end of the program, which is what I do sometimes. 
Because you know what? I, the way I look at it is at the end, the last 20 minutes of the program, nobody listens. So I can go on my little tirades and oh. then certain people listen. Well, I have a compliment. So in closing, oh, really? I just have a compliment, Jason. Oh, thank you. I appreciate all of the work that you do for entrepreneurs with oh. both your launch conference mm. and um, all of the support that you do. So I wanted oh. to say thank you oh. for standing that's up and cool. being a voice. Yeah. I enjoy playing cards with you. Oh, that's fun. Taking money from you sometimes. Sometimes. You know what? You're a tight player um, and I'm a little wild. Yeah. And But I also just appreciate what you do for the entrepreneurial community. So thank I you. I love how he buries the poker dig right in the yeah, middle right of in that the, of incredibly complimentary. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got to come. I think we're playing tomorrow <laughs> night. You want to play tomorrow night? I think we have a little game going tomorrow night, but it's down. It's way down. It's too far for you to travel. Um, but, yeah. you know, maybe we'll have some good wine. Maybe it's worth it. We send you. Maybe we'll, if you lose, we'll pay for your Uber oh. back. Oh, maybe. wow. This All sounds right. like a deal. This might be a good deal. All right, listen, everybody. Uh, if you're going to do uh, an early stage round, I put Dave Samuel right at the top of your list of uh, investors to meet with. Thank you. He's very easy to get in touch with. He's D Samuel on the Twitter, D S A M U E L. And I'm sure he's Dave at freestyle.vc. Uh, you know, pitch him when you think you're ready. Use your, um, use your common sense. You got to yeah. approach the investor knowing what stage they invest in. Yes. People send The blanket you. emails don't work when I'm like BCC. Oh my I'm God. Like, it's just like delete. So yeah, I, my advice is really to try to personalize emails. And then actually just one other note is typically the best way is to come in via referral. And so it's really looking at LinkedIn or looking at other ways of people that know me um, and coming in through a referral. So blank BCC email equals do delete. Not, yeah. Don't ever do that. Don't do it. Like when I get a medical device startup that's emailing me, they're like pre, I'm like, first of all, I don't do medical devices. Second, I, 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 I'm not going to do a technology transfer out of this school I've never heard of right. to, to do an eight year tr clinical trial. Like this, you're talking, you know, you, you might as well be talking Chinese to me. I, I can't understand a word of this. Yeah. Like you should know that. Just look at my portfolio or listen to one episode or read my book. <laughs> I mean, any of those things. I mean, certainly read the book. But then second, like, if you come in through a referral. That's the best way. And if you are not willing to quit your job to start the company in a way you've DQ'd yourself from being a serious founder, like Elon mm -hmm. Musk is not staying at a job until it's safe enough to start his next company. Like, it's just not how it works. Even a young Elon Musk would not do that. And then the same thing with this um, DQing yourself um, by n not being able to find someone on LinkedIn mm -hmm. or going and taking the long game and saying, well, we talked about Patreon today. We talked about Intercom. We, ta we talked about Airtable, WAG. If you used WAG, here's an easy, perfect example. Use WAG for two months or two yeah. weeks or two days and then send Dave an email. Yeah. Love G and this is a direct email. Personalized email, yes. That's the personalized one. Yeah. I used WAG. What an amazing product. I mean, and you know, I, we obviously use Intercom. So we're, you, I love two of the products. I think you'd love what we're doing here yeah. because we share this DNA with those two products, which yes. is customer first, da, 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 and amazing design. All of a sudden, you're reading that email. Yes. Am I right? Yes. And I just came up with that just spitballing here off the top of my head. It's a great idea, Jason. Let alone reaching out to the CEO of WAG or the founder mm -hmm. or of Intercom and saying, hey, I'd love to get coffee with you and explain to my idea, or I love your product, wanted to let you know that, da da da, da here's what I'm working on, and yeah. somehow getting them to forge you on. Yes. What is that worth, like 10x a cold email? Yes, definitely. I'd I mean, say the referral 10X. bumps it way up. Yeah, right now, the way I take it is, if somebody's referring it and they're investing in it, I just like when you send something or so, you know, somebody like one of our peers, it's like you're right. investing and you're referring. I just CC my assistant. Let's have coffee. Right. Yeah. F it. F it. It's like, it, wh why am I even not drafting off of your hard work in that case? Right. That's right. how people should look at it. If, if yeah. Jason's writing a check, Dave's going to say, mm, he did some hard work here. He's got conviction and vice versa. Right. All right. Listen. Uh, as I said, Dave is a tremendous, tremendous investor. And so actually, uh, so is his partner, Josh. Hey, go ahead and visit freestyle.vc. Freestyle.vc. Uh, where'd you get the freestyle from? How'd you come up with that? You name? know, that was interesting. Josh 
had the creative moment with that. And it really has been fun because we like to do things out of the box. We like yeah. to do it our own way. And so Perfect. that's freestyle. Love it. All right. Thanks again, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie and all of the sponsors and partners who make this show possible. You can help the show by going to iTunes, writing a review, a detailed review about how uh, this show has helped you on your entrepreneurial journey. Be candid. If you don't like the show, of course, email me, Jason at Calacanis, and we'll try to do better. But if you, if you, if you think it's a four or five star type situation, go ahead and write that review. Uh, Launch Scale is coming up. LaunchScale.net, it's one of our conferences, uh, two days. We teach you how to grow your company from founders who have successfully grown their companies. And Angel the Book, angelthebook.com. Go ahead and buy the book. We've just broken 200 reviews, a critical moment. 94% of those, 93% of them are five-star reviews. So for those folks who read the book and took the time to write a review, it really, really means a lot to me on a personal basis because I put my heart and soul into the book and I want to write another one. And if I get to, say, 500 of those reviews at the same kind of 90% five-star, it's a no-brainer for HarperCollins to write another check for me to write the next follow-up book. All right, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.